He's going to visit the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. There's plans to kill Yeshua in Jerusalem, but there's a party in Bethany. Let's look at John 12, the first three verses. Yeshua, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Yeshua had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Yeshua and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume." Now, we're told in the other Gospels that he anointed, or she anointed his head also with that perfume. That's in Matthew 26, starting at verse 6. Now, when Yeshua was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume, and she poured it upon his head, and he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Yeshua, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she's done a good deed to me. For the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to preserve me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall also be spoken of in memory of her. Mary's act was one of utter humility. She was exceedingly grateful for Yeshua bringing her brother back to life. She was fully aware and in awe of the Messiah. Let's go back to John 12, verses 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, as he had the money box And he used to pilfer what was put into it. What a scoundrel. What a scoundrel. When Judas betrays Yeshua for 30 pieces of silver, he's totally acting within character. Okay? It's not an out of character thing for this guy. That's what he was. Yeah. You would think that Yeshua would be able to see right through this guy. It's all part of it. No, it's all part of the plan. Yeah. What was the 30 pieces of silver? What did that represent? Uh, that's, a, that's the price of a slave <clears throat> in the Torah. Um, you know, Judas saw these great signs that Yeshua did. I mean, brought people back from the dead. He just saw that and all the signs and wonders that he did. The calming the sea, the lame walk, the blind sea. He didn't care. He wanted the money from this perfume to put in his own pocket. And, okay, we think, well, come on, 300 denarii, how much is that? Uh, actually, that's quite a bit. A denarii was about a day's work for a man. So we're looking at 300. You were looking at a year's salary for the average person. That's what that was. So what, today, 30, 35,000 in Arkansas, something like that? That's what this would have been worth. The perfume came out of India. The herbs for it came from the Himalaya mountains. It made a very strong perfume. Mary had kept this in an alabaster box. Why did she keep it? Why do you think she had it? Well, it ended up being for that purpose. She probably was going to have it used on her own body when she died. But she saw a much better use for that perfume. Verse 7, Yeshua therefore said, let her alone in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Yeshua told him, let her keep it there uh, until the day of his burial. This was a clear declaration to the disciples. He knew he was going to die soon. Verse 8, for the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. The poor will always be with us. And all Yeshua is doing is pointing out that which is said in the Torah once again. Deuteronomy 15, 11, For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. Why will there always be poor in the land? 
That's for us. That way we get to show the love of the Father to others. They're there for us to show the love of the Father to them. Verse 9. The great multitude, therefore, of the Jews learned that he was there, and they came, not for Yeshua's sake only, but that they may also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the multitudes, they came here to see Lazarus as well as Yeshua. Where did that miracle spread out to the people? A long ways. And this, this is going to help explain the huge crowd that's going to greet him. Many of the people were probably curiosity seekers. I could understand that. They're wanting to see the one who came back from the dead after being uh, dead for four days. And the one who performed that miracle. They're both going to be there. Verse 10. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus to, de to death also. <laughs> These guys. <clears throat> There's just no pleasing these guys, is there? They had plans of totally cleaning house. They're going to kill Lazarus also. They're going to destroy Messiah and all the evidence that points to him. Why do you think the disciples were hiding away after the death of Yeshua? They knew they were next. They knew they were next. <clears throat> it seems insane they would want Yeshua killed Knowing full well who he is and the signs he's done, they knew who he was. They knew he was the son of the father. They wanted him dead anyway. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there's one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the, to the dead. Well, that's comforting. Ecclesiastes is, have a lot of things in it that aren't comforting. They're just facts. Facts don't always comfort. John 12, verses 12 and 13. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to try and cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, even the king of Israel. Hosanna is a transliteration of a Hebrew phrase. It means, O oh, save, we pray. <clears throat> um, this, this is, it's, Hosanna, it's from the Greek word. If you look here, it says it's from the, the Hebrew words, 3467, and the Hebrew word 4994. He, uh, Hebrew word 40, uh, 3467 is Yasha. It's Yasha, it means salvation or save. Very similar uh, to the word Yeshua. They come from the, they share the root word and, and meaning too, by the way. And then Na, it means I beseech thee, I pray to you, I pray. So Hosanna means I pray for salvation. I pray that you save us. <clears throat> um, the people are quoting Psalm 118. You can see the capital letters there in the New King James. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, even the King of Israel. They're quoting Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. O Yahweh, do save, we beseech. Yasha na. We beseech thee, O Yahweh, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you from the house of Yahweh. They're calling him king of Israel. They're calling him king of Israel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, even king of Israel. See, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a certain title. That's a title that even, even calls out that this is a manifestation of Elohim. Look at Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Yahweh of hosts. I'm the first and the last, and there is no Elohim besides me. Hmm. Interesting. Zephaniah 3, 15 says, Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. Let's go back to John 12, verses 14 and 15. 
And Yeshua, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Yeshua is publicly presenting himself as the king of Israel, riding on a donkey. <clears throat> this was, yeah, Cliff. Donkey represents uh, kings. That's royalty. Only royalty rode, rode donkeys. And the only ones that amassed uh, numbers of donkeys. Are. Yeah, kings, for the, kings would amass many donkeys for their children. Yeah, well, in this case here, that's what he's saying. He's saying he is the king of Israel. It's in fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 9, verse 9. We read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. One that hadn't been written, if you'll recall. Yeshua came to make full the prophecies of the Tanakh. Um, in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, don't think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to make full. That's what that Greek word pleiru means. <clears throat> not to, in, in that word abolish, it doesn't really mean abolish either. It means to deplete. I didn't come here to deplete, but to make replete, to fill it up. You see, it was being repleted by the Pharisees. And the scribes of that day, the Torah was, and the prophets were. Yeshua said, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the Torah until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, and so teaches others, shall be called least by those in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great by those in the kingdom of heaven. I say that because that's how it is intended. It doesn't mean you're going to be in the kingdom, but you're going to be least. No, that's not what that means. That's what people interpret this as. And one very fine man uh, that used to come here uh, researched this. And this is where he put his hope for his loved ones. It was on Matthew 5, 19. Maybe they'll be in the kingdom and just be called least. And I told him, well, actually, that word in there, that Greek preposition, can also mean by. And it doesn't fit as well, but that's the intent of the passage. Whoever then annuls each of, or one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least by those that are in the kingdom. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great by those in the kingdom. Make sense? Well, great, not greatest. Yeah, but if you're, you're, you're the least of creatures if you ignore the Torah and teach against it. So, inside or outside? Outside the kingdom. But those in the kingdom will say you're the least. Uh, uh, and just stay out there and gnash your teeth and weep. Yeah, Tom? Um, you know, the, the Christians take the first part of that 517 say like it does away with the law, but then 18 makes it crystal clear. But that's not the case. You, right. You, you don't change the smallest thing in the law. Right. Now, how, how could they be that? Well, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they're just, they're just following their heart instead of what the scripture says. Their heart says it's okay. They're just brain dead dumb. Well, no, that is. They're following their heart. I know that's, that's what they're doing. Let's look at John 12, verse 16. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Yeshua was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Now, keep in mind, John is writing these things many years after it happened. Uh, many people think that he wrote this some 50 years after it happened, and he may have. Uh, they didn't understand until after Yeshua was glorified. These things were concealed from them by the Spirit, by the breath of the Father. In Luke 9, verses 44 and 45, we read this. Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. 
but they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. And in Luke 18, verses 31 through 34, and he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they've scourged him, they'll kill him, and on the third day he'll rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Let's go back to John 12, verses 17 and 18. And so the multitude who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing him witness. For this cause also the multitude went and met him, because they heard that he had performed this sign. Many of the people were testifying to this miraculous sign of Yeshua raising Lazarus from the dead. And this was prophesied also in Psalm 145, verses 6 and 7. And men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. And they shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and shall shout joyfully of your righteousness. John 12, verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see that you're not doing any good. Look, the world's gone after him. Well, the, the bad guys now, they're already starting to point fingers at one another. They're furious. This man had publicly humiliated them on many occasions. Now he's being glorified today. And how does that make us look? Elohim planned for his son to die at the time during Passover, at the time the lamb was slain. This act of publicly proclaiming himself as king will cause the Pharisees to fulfill this prophecy and make them do what they have to do. Verses 20 and 21. Now there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Yeshua. <clears throat> um, only John mentions these Greeks that came at that time. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention them at all. This shows, though, how far away this message of the raising of Lazarus had gone. It had gone to, uh, in just a few days to a good portion of the world. And why did they come to Philip? That's a good question. Philip was a Greek name. That's why they probably thought he was one of them. And I, I think that's why they went to him. Greek was a common language in, the, in that day, but the, the Greek guy, let's talk to him. Verses 22 and 23, and Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and they told Yeshua. And Yeshua answered them, saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Well, this is the time of Messiah. I love this part. When we go over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we always go over this. But this is this is, this is crazy good stuff. You should have been saying, you know, or up till now. Well, here he's saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Before that, he kept saying, my time is not yet. Remember in John 2, verse 4? And Yeshua said to her, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. The people aren't supposed to see me as Messiah. John 7, 6, Yeshua therefore said to them, my time is not yet at hand, but your time is always opportune. Well, on this day, though, Yeshua said, the time's come. This is the hour. He means this specific day is the day. That was prophesied by Daniel. Daniel predicted that Messiah would come on that very day. And Yeshua verified that this was the day spoken of by Daniel. Let's take a look in Luke's version of this. Very interesting, the way it's worded. Luke 19, starting at verse 37, And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise Elohim joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of Yahweh, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, 
I tell you, if they become silent, the stones will cry out. It's this day that's very important. And when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known this day, even this day, the things which make for peace. Very important. He's weeping over what city? We're going to see why. But now they've been hidden from your eyes. For days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you, surround you, and hem you in on every side, and will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. See, they should have known when he was coming. They should have known, but they didn't. So let's look at Daniel's prophecy here one more time concerning the time of Messiah. Daniel 9, this is the 70 weeks. Starting at verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So the starting point for this prophecy is very important to the correct understanding of this prophecy. Uh, this has to fit into secular history on a certain date. And there have been a lot of suggestions for the starting time of this. Uh, there, were, there were several decrees that, were, that told the, the Jews to go back to Judah. Um, the first one was by Cyrus, and there was a decree of Darius, and there was a decree of Arctic Shackshaw. And they all said, go back and rebuild your temple. Go back and rebuild the temple. But what does this say? No one discerned that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, doesn't say the temple. Uh, you're going to build it. You're going to build it with the moat, the plaza, so the walls are going to be rebuilt. When were they told to go back and do that? That they were told in Nehemiah. There were three decrees in Ezra, but when we get to Nehemiah, this is the one that says rebuild the city, and it's the only one that does so. Nehemiah two verse one. It came about in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes. Believe it or not, that's how you're supposed to pronounce that name. I looked it up several times and memorized it. Okay, now every time I see Artaxerxes, I'm thinking Artaxerxes. All right. That wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence. Nehemiah knew you don't go up to the king with, and give him his wine. <laughs> no, no. You know what, wine giver? You just put me in a bad mood. Don't put the king in a bad mood. Heads will roll. And, you know, it's an expression nowadays, but it came from that day. All right, heads really did roll. So he says, I had never been said in his presence. And that was, that was that's a good thing. Well, <clears throat> the 20th anniversary of the reign of Arctic Shekshaw, as mentioned in Nehemiah 1, would have been March 16th, 445 B.C., according to secular history. There's our starting point. Because this decree, if you read, we'll read the first eight verses there, it would say, go back and rebuild your walls and your city. Now, uh, in verse 26, the first, by the way, it says, first of all, there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It'll be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. The first seven weeks brings us to 397 B.C. And keep in mind, weeks, a week's, that's seven years is what we found out. That's what it means. But it's not years like we reckon a year. A year like they reckoned back then, and all the surrounding nations did the same thing. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, a year was 360 days. So if you look at a year that way, and you go by the first seven weeks, which would be seven times seven, it's 49 years, uh, scriptural years, 360-day years. That's when the walls were built. That's when the city was rebuilt, after seven. And then it says, <clears throat> Messiah the Prince, after 62 more weeks, Messiah the Prince will be there. Well, look at this in verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Hmm. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Ooh. 
The people of the prince, there's the prince, there's this, uh, that's the prince that governs the Roman Empire, is going to come. He's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary after that, after Messiah is destroyed. What, what was Yeshua crying about? What was he crying over? Destruction. Of Jerusalem. He knew it was coming, not because the Father whispered it in his ear. Not because he could see into the future. Maybe he could if he wanted to, maybe. But that's not why he's doing it. It's because Daniel says it. The Father told Daniel this. It's then will come with a flood, even to the end, there'll be war, desolations are determined. It was a horrible wipeout. Hundreds of thousands of Jews killed. Maybe even in the millions even. And the rest were taken into slavery. <clears throat> um, now, it says Messiah will be cut off and, and have nothing. So according to the passage, we have... 49 times 7, that's uh, 476 years. And at 360 days per year, let me think, I'll do it in my head real quick. That's 173,880 days, okay? Now, if you project that many days ahead from the first of Nisan in 445 B.C., we come to the 10th of Nisan, April 6th in A.D. 32. That's the day Yeshua rode into Jerusalem. His hour had come. His hour had come. Look at how, how this reads again. So you are to know and discern from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. From that, we got, we got that date, March 14th, 445 B.C., until Messiah the Prince. There's going to be 476 years of 360 days each. It takes us exactly to that time, to that day, to that day. No. 32 AD. That's the day Yeshua rode into Jerusalem. His hour had come. Show you how the calculations work again. 483 times 360 is 173,880 days. There are 365.2422 days in a year. So to get solar years, that comes to 476.068 solar years. The, restore to re, uh, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was March 14th, 445 BCE, which would have been 444.8 BCE. That's how far you are from the end of the BC era to year zero. So if you take 444.8 and subtract out 476.068, or do verse, it's a, it's a negative. You end up at 31.268 CE. You add one year because there's no year zero. You go straight from 1 BC to 1 AD. There's no year zero when you do this. So you end up with 32, the year 32.268. You go to the 32 year 32 and CE plus 97 days. 97 days exactly takes you to April 6th on a Sunday. On a Sunday, Thursday was Passover in that week, in that year. Yeshua was crucified on a Thursday. <clears throat> All these, this was first done by the chief inspector of Scotland Yard, Sir Robert Anderson, in the early 1900s. And it's a magnificent book. He did a great job. People have argued this. Oh, no, that's off by a day or two. Whatever. Whatever. I'll, I'll trust the chief inspector of Scotland Yard on this. Using the same, this is the same equation we use for Ezekiel's time frames. It's the same equations we're using for the rest of them. A 360-day year, and a day is a year. <clears throat> After the 69th week, Messiah will be cut off. What happened? He was crucified just a few days later. <clears throat> um, after the 69th week, it, it says also after that, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And the temple, not one stone was left upon another. Not one stone. <clears throat> yes. Well, I mean, some of them lived, but most of them. We're, a lot of them were destroyed, yes. Any questions on that before we move on? See, that's the hour of Messiah. That's why I kept saying, don't, 
My, my time's not yet. Remember when he would heal somebody, what would he tell them? Don't tell anybody. Yep. And what would they do? They go out and tell everybody. Yeah, I would <laughs> Look at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. You know, a lot of people will argue this, too. The seed doesn't die. Well, when a grain of, grain of wheat is planted, the seed has to be planted in the ground and really die as a seed in order to grow into a plant. As a seed, it dies. You can't pull up something that was grown by a seed, pull up the roots and say, oh, well, there's that seed. Why not? It died. It became the plant. And the seed itself isn't alive. It's an amazing thing. Because there's, there's wheat that were, uh, there's, there's grains of wheat that were buried with uh, pharaohs in, in tombs that is still wheat. But yeah, I mean, that is a good way to put it. Uh, the, the grain of wheat has to die. <clears throat> and then life springs forth from it, and, and it gives life-giving bread from that. Yeshua was the same way. He gave us new life, but that only happened through his death. It's through the death of Yeshua that the spirit or breath of Elohim dwells in his people. It was prophesied that through his death, he would see his offspring prolong his days, justify the many, and bear their iniquities. That's Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. <clears throat> as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great. He'll divide the booty with the strong because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. Let's go back to John 12, verse 25. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. Yeshua mentions this particular teaching several times in the other Gospels. He says, we are not to live our lives like the Gentiles live their lives. We are to seek first his kingdom and its righteousness. Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33. Do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. When Yeshua states these same words in Luke, we're told Yeshua said, For how is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his life? What good is that? You want the whole world, but it'll cost you your life. <coughs> in Luke 9, verses 24 and 25, Excuse me, for whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Yeshua is telling us to hate our life outside of our Father's instructions. We're to live our life according to his Torah, then we live eternally. Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17, And behold, one came to him, saying, Teacher, what good thing... Shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? He said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, you have to love Jesus. I'm interpreting the, the Greek for you there. That's the way the churches have interpreted it for years. <clears throat> Keep the commandments. That's what we are to do. Verse 26 of John 12, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. <clears throat> well, what does Yeshua mean by follow him? Follow him. What he means by that is, walk as he walked in obedience to the Father. 
into the Torah. 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Got to be as holy as the, as the Father is. That's what he says. John 12, verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Okay, Yeshua knows what's going to happen, but he's not excited about it. He's not happy about it. That's a high price he has to pay. But it's like he said previously. He said, I'm, a good, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That was just in John 10, verses 11 through 15. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hireling and he's not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Going back to John 12, verse 28. Father, glorify your name. There came therefore a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Um, Yeshua spoke out, or the Father spoke out to Yeshua two other times. At his baptism and his transfiguration. And here he speaks out. What does Yeshua want more than anything? Look at the first four words there. What did, what did Moses want more than anything? Yeah. Yeah, Cliff. That's what he wants. What's the side wants his actions and whatever to glorify the Father. Yep. He wants, he wants his actions to glorify the Father. That's what Moses wanted too. It's the same thing. Prophet like Moses. Remember that? Don't forget that. That's a big deal. <clears throat> it's like that IOU for that Lamborghini. Don't lose that. That's important. Verse 29 of John 12. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it were saying that it also thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. The people watching, they were confused. They were wrong in their assumptions. Uh, one, one group heard it and thought it was an angel, and others thought it was just thunder. And they, they weren't sure. They wanted to attach it, attach it to a natural phenomenon. Verse 30, Yeshua answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. <clears throat> yeah, Elohim didn't speak to Yeshua for the sake of, of his son. He wants the people to hear it so they can believe. Verse 31, now judgment is upon this world, now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. The ruler of this world, uh, he'll be cast out, that's Satan. John 14, 30, I'll not speak much more with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. John 16, 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Well, he says, he says the ruler of this world uh, is, uh, shall be cast out. Well, isn't he still around? You know what I think he's saying? He's going to be cast out of heaven. That's what he's talking about, as in Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war, and the dragon with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. This is all symbolic, but it's describing a real thing. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I believe that's when we got Islam. Well, isn't that why the Christians think the devil was thrown out of heaven in that verse here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the entrance of Islam into the world myself. And I can prove that over longer stretches of teaching Revelation. 
it fits very well. Verses 32 and 33 of John 12. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Yeshua is going to be lifted up, uh, up from the earth onto a tree, which was the kind of death he would suffer. Verse 34, the multitude therefore answered him, We've heard out of the Torah that the Messiah is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Now, when the people say, we know according to the law, they're talking about the Tanakh. That's what they referred to as the, as all what we know as the Old Testament, the Tanakh was the law to them. Now, there was the law, the Torah, and there was the Torah of Moses. That's the first five books. That, that, was the, that was the ultimate, was the Torah of Moses. Because they knew that Elohim spoke directly to Moses, face to face. <clears throat> but the people knew from the Tanakh the name of Messiah would endure forever. How'd they know that? In 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13, we read, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Isaiah 9, 7, There'll be no end to the increase of his government or peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Yahweh of hosts will accomplish all this. Psalm 89, verses 35 through 37. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever. His throne shall be as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness in the sky is faithful. Selah. Ezekiel 37, verses 24 and 25. And my servant David will be king over them, and they mean son of David. And they will all have one shepherd. And they'll walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. And they shall live on the land that I gave to Jacob my servant, in which your fathers lived. They shall live on it, they and their sons' sons, and their sons' sons forever. And David my servant shall be their prince forever. So they associated with the Son of Man being lifted up to him being killed. They couldn't figure out how, why this had to happen. John 12, verses 35 and 36. Yeshua therefore said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, in order that you may become sons of light. These things Yeshua spoke, and he departed and hid himself from them. <clears throat> Yeshua invited them to follow him before he disappears from, from their presence for, in, his, uh, in his body. Yeshua will not speak publicly again until he comes to the earth to establish his kingdom. That was it. That was his last public speaking. John 12, verses 37 and 38 but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be made full, which he spoke, Master who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? And John here is speaking about uh, Isaiah 53. And let's look at the first five verses on that. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of Elohim, and afflicted. But he's pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. <clears throat> Going back to John 12, verses 39 and 40. For this cause they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, he hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted and I heal them. 
This is a reference to, John, or to Isaiah 6, verse 10. And he said, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Elohim's blinded their eyes, he's hardened their hearts, so they can't be converted and healed. They're not a part of his people. <clears throat> See, I keep going back and forth here. The Psalms, Isaiah, uh, the Torah. If you study the Tanakh, you see what is being looked for in the Tanakh is exactly Yeshua as Messiah. What's being described there over and over and over again. Of the one to come, and that's the guy, and it's proved over and over and over in Scripture. Verses 41 through 43. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of Elohim. So a lot of the Pharisees believed in him, but they weren't going to say nothing. How could they not believe his miracles? But just believing he's a miraculous person is meaningless. Uh, it's like people today. Do you have faith in Jesus? Well, sure. Yep. I'm all for him. If, matter of fact, if he were running for mayor, I'd vote for him, wouldn't you? I'd put a sign in my yard. Yes, I would. And if he gave me a t-shirt to wear. There. Now I'm saved, right? No. No. I mean, just a vote of confidence. Yeah, Jesus. Woo-hoo. That's nothing. That's meaningless. My gosh. That's, that has as much to do with salvation in the kingdom as calling the hogs does. Okay? Well... They must confess him, and confession must result in righteousness. Confession has to result in righteousness. We read what Paul wrote in Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faithfulness which we're preaching. That if you confess with your mouth, Yeshua As master, and believe in your heart that Elohim raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The last Baptist preacher that darkened my doorway read that to me. Read that to me. And I said, very good, read the next verse. I don't know that he'd ever read it in his life. But he did, he said, for with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. What? Resulting in what? Righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. With the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. Define the word right. Use that book in your hand. Define for me the the word righteousness. Using that book in your hand. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I mean Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. Open it up and read it to me. And it'll be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe his laws, commandments, statutes, and ordinances. With your heart that you believe, does it cause you to, to follow his laws, commandments, statutes, and ordinances or not? Well, I know we don't need that. And I said, well, then everything you just read is meaningless. Yeah, it's getting late. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's getting late. <laughs> yeah. He made my day, though. <laughs> John 12, verses 44 through 46. And Yeshua cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who beholds me beholds the one who sent me. I become as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. You know, this, it, it, it's, it almost gives, you, gives me chills when I read this. The first time I understood what he means. When I started following his Torah, I quit looking, uh, in pra- I quit praying to Jesus. And I quit looking to love Jesus more. And I started looking at the Father. Oh, it's the Father. He's the one. Yeah. 
Yeshua is the Messiah, I believe in him. I believe in the all-powerful creator. I believe in his ways. And that's through Yeshua as Messiah and what he did in sending the breath of the Father down here. Now you can know the Father. See that another mention of him being the light of the world here. He's reminding them again of the blind man he cured. Really. He'll open the eyes of those who are blind and need the light of the world. Verses 47 and 48. And if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I don't judge him. For I did not come, into the wor- did, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings, he has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. <laughs> you sure didn't come to earth to judge men. Nope. He's not going to do it. The word is going to judge him. The Torah is what's going to judge man. Man will get his chance in court to be judged by Torah according to what he's done. Going to get your chance in court. Revelation 20, verse 12, says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Books, more than one, plural. That's the Torah, the books of the Torah. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. Pretty straightforward. And the last two verses in John 12, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. He did not speak on his own initiative. The Father gave him the words to say and the words to speak. We are accountable for following him because he is the prophet like Moses. Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. Yahweh your Elohim will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your countrymen you shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of Yahweh your Elohim. Excuse me. And Horeb on the day of the assembly saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my Elohim. Let me not see this great fire anymore lest I die. Remember we're talking about that great fire was melting Mount Sinai. It was melting it, the earth was shaking, and the thunder was booming. And they said, don't let him talk to me anymore, or I'll die. And and the father says in verse 17, and Yahweh said to me, they've spoken well. Yeah, they might, they might die. Okay, well how can we get words from the father without dying? So he says in verse 18, I'll raise up a prophet from, their, from among their countrymen like, like you, Moses, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them to, all, to them all that I command him. Look at this. My father himself who sent me is giving me a commandment, what to say, what to speak. Therefore the things I speak, I speak just as the father told me. And it shall come, to ba- come about that whoever will not listen to my words, with which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Any, uh, any questions on that chapter of John, John 12? Uh, let's see, the last Passover, I believe, is the next chapter. And that, that's interesting stuff, too. We'll, we'll talk about foot washing. We'll talk about, and y'all leave your shoes on, but we'll talk about foot, foot washing. And we'll talk about the Passover and things that, were, that are described there. I think you'll find it interesting. What are your questions? Any? Let's, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you as always for your word. It's truly uh, such a magnificent gift that you've given us, insight into you and into your people and, and how you want us to live. We pray, Father, that through our study and through our lives that your name be glorified and may Yahweh bless us and keep us. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon us and give us shalom. Amen.